Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining me on this session. In this talk <clears throat> about generators, coroutines, and other related concepts, I'm only going to focus on the side of uh, that the user, the user-facing side of these issues, <clears throat> and take a slightly broader view of various design patterns that relate to these subjects and how they relate, interrelate. Some of these patterns you already know, some of them you may have not thought to be connected in such a way. So I'm not really going to talk about... Sorry. <coughs> I'm not going to explain a lot of the compiler magic that's going into uh, coroutines. I am mostly trying to motivate you to uh, understand what coroutines are all about and stimulately stimulate you to uh, learn more about them. So, say we want to iterate over all the elements of a vector. So we have this function called vector8. Is this better? Can you still hear me? Okay, cool. Hmm? Ma? Okay? Nope. Okay. Right, so say we want to iterate over all the elements of a vector and print them out. So we have a function or a subroutine called uh, vector8, and you can see that it actually does two separate things. The first thing it does is it iterates over all the elements of, this, of the vector or the container or the sequence, and then it performs some kind of operation over each of the elements of this, okay? each of the elements of this sequence. So, if I wanted to iterate over the elements and maybe sum them up and not print them, or maybe sum them and print them, then I'd actually have to write a new function, right? So let's look at another example, which is slightly different. Let's say I want to draw a line on an image. Then I can look at various res online resources about uh, line drawing, and we may come up about a uh, uh, come across a Bresenham algorithm, it has many variations. This is a very simple variant. And you can see, without going into a lot of the details, what it really does, it does two things. It takes two points, two endpoints of a line, and then it iterates over each pixel of the image and performs some kind of operation. In this case, it calls a function called put pixel on this image. I'm sorry, on the pixel. Now, if we read the code, try to think about the assumptions that we're making when we're actually calling the put pixel function. First of all, of course, we're assuming that it's available in the scope because, or in the linking phase because otherwise our code is not going to compile and it's not going to link. Um, another assumption that we're making is that we got, the, of course, the, the signature correct and that it will actually do what we expect it to do, uh, which is, in this case, to give some color uh, which you can see here, the color is seven, um, to the pixel. And there is another implicit assumption that we're making here, and that is that it's actually going to return to our algorithm. So there is no guarantee that this external function, which is called put pixel, is actually going to return control into our own code because our code is still in mid computation, right? So if we look at these. Uh, what's common between these two apparently very uh, dissimilar functions, we can see that they have two properties which are very common to subroutines, to regular functions or subroutines, and that's, first of all, they're eager. So they, they, pro they do not return until they process all of the elements in the sequence that we're uh, processing. And the other one is that they're closed. When I say closed, I mean that they perform a predefined operation over the whole sequence or every, over each element of the sequence. Now, this may, may be uh, sufficient for certain values, but still, it kind of limits the way uh, or the number or makes us uh, have to write sometimes a lot of functions which do this essentially logically doing the same thing, but they maybe we don't want to have eager and closed. And one common mitigation that you might say, yes, I did, but uh, you know, you can always use uh, callbacks. 
And you know, C++ has a whole bunch of callback, callback uh, mechanisms. Um, we have uh, function pointers which go back to the C days. Uh, we have lambdas themselves. And of course, we have callable template parameters. We can use concepts and generally pass uh, kind of generalized callbacks. But even these solutions, when we're talking about callbacks, they have their own drawbacks. And let me just uh, enumerate some of them. The first one is called inversion of control, and this is what I mentioned before. There's no guarantee that the external code is trustworthy and that it's valid or correct, and it's actually going to return the control back to us and do the correct thing, because we're still in mid-computation. Let's say we allocated resources. We need to go come back into our function so that we can free up this, these resources. Another more conceptual or logical problem is uh, what I call the callback hell. And this means that the program flow and understanding and reasoning about the logic of our program when we're using callbacks means that we now have to, write, to read part of the logic inside our function, then go find the first callback, try to reason about what that callback is doing. That might be in, a separate part, in another part of the file or maybe in a separate file altogether, sometimes in a separate system, and then come back, understand the repercussion of going back and forth and reasoning and debugging this kind of code uh, makes it very difficult to understand. And I'm not even talking about uh, uh, the, the performance cost of function calls. So, although callbacks allow us to have uh, um, non-closed functions because we sort of outsource the actual function, there's, these functions are still eager. So they're still iterating over all of the elements of our sequence. And it begs the question, is there a way that we can somehow flip all of these subroutines inside out such that we can get, uh, uh, allow them to be lazy and also not commit to some predefined operation? And the answer, which you may or may not realize, but most of you already know it, has been with us since Alex Stepanov came up with the concept of iterators back in 1993. Uh, we've had them in uh, C++ since 1998. And iterators essentially solve exactly these two issues. They allow us to externalize the iteration over the elements and allow the user to perform the, the operation outside of the iteration loop. And we're, all, we're very familiar with iterators, and they frequently come in actually in two types. Uh, we have uh, standalone types, and a nice property of many iterators is that very frequently they're only implicitly coupled to an actual sequence. So a vector is an example where we have uh, a physical concrete sequence inside our memory, but sometimes that's not even... Uh, that doesn't even exist. So uh, let's see some examples that we have in the standard. We have the standard uh, STD iStream iterator for reading elements from a stream and a st uh, uh, streaming iterate operator. And notice that in this case, there is no sequence in the memory because it hasn't happened yet. We're reading values from the future, essentially, right? Uh, another example is the reverse iterator, which is actually not really... Of, it's, an it's called an iterator adapter. It takes another iterator type and sort of reverses it. Um, C++17 gave us the recursive directory iterator, and this is a, an iterator object that recursively iterates over the elements of a directory and its subfolders. Now, in this case, the actual underlying sequence, again, it's not an object in the memory of our program, it's the actual file system of, uh, of the, the computer we're running on. So there is no explicit sequence that we can access in any other way, but the iterators abstract that away and allow us to, uh, to, to iterate over that. Another nice thing about iterators is that we're not limited only to standard provided iterators, but we can also write our own. So staying with the line, the, the line drawing example, and I, I 
I do a lot of uh, image processing, uh, so uh, a lot of my examples are going to be from image processing space, but I think it gives a very clear, visually helpful example. So uh, there's a, an open source library called OpenCV. Many of you uh, may have heard about it. And it has this class called the CV line iterator. And it's, used, it's an iterator to iterate over all the pixels on the rasterized line connecting two points. Now, you can see the code here. I basically copy-pasted it from, from, the, from the library. Uh, there, there's a lot of things we can say about it, but it does have the typical iterator object type API. I simplified it a bit for the important points I want to uh, emphasize. And note that, again, it doesn't have an actual underlying sequence. We have an image which is kind of a two-dimensional di two array. We give it two points, and then it uses some kind of lazy mechanism to give us back a pointer to, to the next pixel along the line. So, but this, again, it does uh, lazy. And how do we use it? Uh, we, we can go over and we can see it has a constructor that gets the, the endpoint and start points and a, a few additional parameters to select the underlying algorithm. It has the uh, increment operator, um, access operator, and a whole bunch of internal members, which are global, but I'm not going to comment on that. Um, and how do we use it? This is an example of copying the pixel values from the line into an external buffer. So in this case, we create the line iterator, giving it an image two and two points. And this iterator has an internal member called count which tells us how many points are on the line. Then we can use a simple loop and just access each of the pixels one by one. There's a casting uh, operation here done. But again, that's uh, part of this particular API, not a general thing about iterators. And once we have an iterator, we can do anything with these pixels. So we can co copy them as, if, as we did here, but we can also change their color. And essentially, that's how you draw uh, um, lines on an image. And there was a talk here earlier about rendering, so this is what rendering is all about. Um, it, it allows us to create all kinds of effects along these lines. We can count values, we can sum values, and again, it's really up to the user. The iterator algorithm or the iterator object doesn't need to do, doesn't need to know or be aware what a future user is going to do to this bunch of pixels. Now, this is really the power of iterators. They allow us to, uh, ex um, to abstract and externalize the access to the elements in a lazy way. But alas, iterators themselves are also an imperfect abstraction. So if we look at the code, we saw that it has public members. I'm not going to mention that, because uh, maybe we could devise a better API, which doesn't expose them. Similarly, I mentioned the, the uh, casting that requires for the underlying pointer. Again, that's something that can be fixed at the library level. I want to talk about something, uh, about a few problems which are inherent to the way we use iterators. And in fact, it's inherent to all of the iterators that we see in the, in the library itself. And these, I call them the awkward coupling and the distributed logic problem. And let's go over them one by one. So. One question that every iterator object needs to answer is how do we know when the sequence is done? Every uh, iterator type or iterator object writer needs to ask themselves how the API is going to provide the information when we're done. So if we look at uh, the examples that we see here, we can see CV line iterator gave us uh, the it.count member, which means that this is the maximal number of times we can increment our pointer and get access to the pixel. So here we have an actual number. Uh, stood stream, uh, I stream iterator becomes equal to the, um, to the default constructed I stream uh, iterator object. So there is some kind of universal end object that we need to compare to to know that we're done. Uh, the recursive iterator we saw before has, we need to compare it to something called the R end, it's the reverse end, and the stood rever uh, recursive directory iterator is equal, uh, we know we're done when the free function std end over the iterator 
uh, becomes equal. So we see four different ways, and of course these are just the examples that I, I showed. Every iterator writer needs to know how to answer the qu this question, and this is not an obvious thing. It's, it's, a, a, it's a burden on the user to learn how to use these, uh, these different issues. Now, to make things even worse, there's another problem which is even uh, more difficult, and this is if you look at this code, can you see what, why this code uh, is undefined behavior? Sorry? There are different vectors. The, the first vector is called, is a std vector of integers, v1, and the second vector is called vl. Okay? And we're passing the sort algorithm v1.begin and vl.end. So we're actually passing iterators from two different vectors, but because they have exactly the same type, this code is going to compile, and in the best case, it's going to crash. In the worst case, it's not going to crash. And we don't know what your program is. It's going to be, uh, undefined. this is undefined behavior, and we don't know what your program is going to do. So we're putting a lot of burden and responsibility over the user to understand uh, how to properly uh, use and not misuse and not abuse um, iterators. So um, how do we solve that? Well, we have ranges. Ranges, uh, we got, sorry, we got ranges in C++20, and really, uh, as it says here on the slide, they're an abstraction over iterators. So uh, they really come to solve the problem of the awkward coupling because they pair together a begin and end iterator, or a begin iterator and some kind of uh, number of times you're allowed to do it, or uh, additionally, an iterator and some stopping condition. They abstract over the iteration and provide a single object, which is called the range. And uh, it allows us to get uh, very high composition uh, capabilities over the regular, sorry, regular STL algorithms and create things like pipe, uh, uh, pipelines. And they're, they're really awesome. So if you haven't learned about ranges yet, you should definitely go and check them out. Um, however, They still have another problem, which is inherent to them, and I'm, I'm probably going to do a disservice to ranges because they really are awesome, and you really, really should check them out. Uh, but I want to talk about the other issue with iterators, and because ranges are an abstraction over iterators, they still suffer from the same issue, and that's what I call the distributed logic of writing uh, an iterator type, or a range, or a generator. So. Essentially, what we call generator is an iterator type that returns values incrementally. And one of the problems we're, when we're going to write an iterator object is what I call the distributed logic, and it's kind of like the cotton of callback hell. Because it means that when we're looking at the implementation of the API, of the iterator API, and this is more on the library writer's side, but still, since we're developers, we need to know how to write these iterator types to, and to make them easy to write, or easy for users to use them, we need to write them. And I, uh, you can identify two problems, the distributed logic and the centralized state. So we can see the code for, uh, this is a rough outline of the code for the CV line iterator on the right, and you can see that a lot of the logic for managing what happens uh, during iteration, because we have to keep, uh, to allow the user to use the, the to perform multiple accesses, is really split between the constructor, which initializes things, then we have the increment operator, which needs to keep some kind of state, and then the decrement, op uh, the increment operator and the, and the access control, and trying to reason about this logic becomes more and more difficult, especially if our state becomes more and more complex. So maybe a single line iterator, uh, relatively easy to understand, but we can think about much more uh, complex accesses, which will make this code um, even more difficult because the logic is split between multiple methods. And of course, some iterators will support decrement and may support uh, plus equals and may support, have multiple versions of many methods. Yes, yes.
Okay, so the question was about the single responsibility of each method. So yes, even if you adhere to the, the concept of a single responsibility for function, still the logic of this seemingly simple uh, construct uh, is split between multiple methods. And I'll show, uh, in just a minute, I'll show you exactly what I mean and why it's more complex. Another issue is that the centralized state is that because we have the logic split up between multiple methods, we need to keep a whole bunch of state, state variables as members. And we, even though not all the methods need access to all of these members, uh, we still need to keep them in members, and then we're losing a lot of things like mutability and cost constness and, and scope limitations and things like that. So I, I did a little exercise, and I basically took the code on the right, and I wrote a serial function on the left, which I called um, process line, and I just copy-pasted the logic from the right into a single function, and we got this nice serial function like we saw at the beginning of the talk. So we're kind of stuck in this, uh, we, we have to choose, because on the left, we have a nice serial function with a local state, we have nice um, access to members, they're, they're, not limited, they're limited only to the scope of the function, but still we need to do this, do something, kind of commit to the, what we call the closed uh, uh, function, because we have to commit to this do function operation at the end. On the other hand, so we have the centralized logic, but eager and closed. And on the other side, we have the nice features of um, separating the iteration and the operations, but we got stuck with the distributed logic and the centralized state. So the question that comes up, is there a way that we can have the best of both worlds? having to, to decide between really difficult to implement algorithms for iterative APIs and still have the easy way of reading and maintaining and debugging serial logic. And the answer, of course, is why we're here. It's coroutines. Now, you might think that coroutines are new because they, they came into C++20. Uh, but in fact, the term was coined in 1958. Uh, they have a very long history. Boost has had multiple coroutine libraries since um, uh, the early 2000s, and there are, I've seen C libraries that uh, go back to uh, before the millennium. So it's not a new concept. And we can summarize, summarize a coroutine very simply. So first of all, a coroutine is a function in C++. So but it has a following uh, properties. It can suspend execu execution, so it can stop in mid-computation. It can return an intermediate value where, whenever it's suspended. It can be resumed later, so we can resume. And it, resumed, it resumes from the same point where it suspended earlier. So, I want to emphasize that this also is not, this is very, very different from what we think of as threading. Because threading, the operating system essentially freezes the program, copies its internal state, and then resumes it later whenever uh, the thread gets rescheduled. Here, the, the program itself is going to say when it's ready to terminate or when it's ready to, to suspend and the user will decide when, it wants to, when uh, they want to resume. Um, there's a slight, I, I'll make a slight detour here. C++20 has what's called uh, uh, stackless coroutines, because many operating systems and CPUs today have support for uh, coroutines by copying the registers. It's, it's, very, it's like light threads, it's called fibers, frequently called fibers, and those are called stackful coroutines. So we're only gonna talk about the stackless coroutines, although there is a stack and it's allocated on the heap. Uh, I'll get to that a little bit in, the, uh, in, uh, in a minute, but it might be a little confusing. Um, so if we think about this definition, about a function that can 
It knows when it wants to suspend and give back a value, and then it can be recalled again. This is exactly what we were looking for. So if we look at process line, the functions that we just had, if by some way process line became a core routine, then instead of calling do something at the end, we could just, what's called, yield the pixel value, allow the user to do whatever they want with that particular value, and then whenever the user is ready, resume running the, our, our nice linear, easily to, uh, easy to analyze function until we get back to the, the next uh, yielding point. Sorry? So, okay, the question is whether we're managing the call outside of the function. The for loop, well, it doesn't have to be a for loop. You can iterate uh, in many different ways. So, yes, uh, when we have a generator type which exposes the external iteration, then the iteration is done outside on the user level, although our implementation does actually have a loop inside. So, in a way, we have two loops. One happens on the stack, what's called the stack frame. It's the internal logic of our coroutine function. The other one happens on the user side, uh, and in that case, the user might um, decide when they want to stop or not. So, um, what does it take for a C++ 20 function to be a coroutine? So, actually, the definition is very, very simple. If the body of the function, and this is really important to make this distinction, the only way to know if a function that we're calling is a coroutine is by examining its implementation. So coroutines are purely an implementation detail. By looking at the API, the function signature of a function, there's no way to know whether or not that particular function is uh, a coroutine or not. Um, so the only way, so as I said, it's an implementation detail, and that means that the compiler will turn a function into a coroutine if one of these three uh, conditions are met. First of all, it uses the co-await uh, operator to suspend execution until it's resumed. Whether it uses the keyword co-yield to suspend execution and return a value, or it uses the keyword co-return to complete execution and return a value. So how do we know if a function is a coroutine from a signature? We can't. And you might say, you know, but if, if a function is a coroutine, then maybe you can tell if it's a function by its return type, but that's not true uh, either, because we might have a function that's, re that's returning the value of a coroutine. So we really, c there is no way, and it's designed intentionally that way, and uh, we'll see some example. So let's see some very, very easy code. We have a little function here, it's called Zorro, and what does Zorro it returns 42, right? Uh, the return type, int, of course. And uh, is it a coroutine? No, it's not a coroutine. Why? It, do it doesn't contain any of the co keywords, right? So we have a new, another function here. It's called coro. And the question is what does it return? Well, it doesn't return f uh, uh, 42. The return type is not int, uh, and it is a coroutine, right? And how, how do we use this? Well, we can put it in a range for loop, uh, like the example above, because remember, we, when we're core yielding, uh, it behaves just like an iterator type. It's a generator. And uh, how many times will this loop run? Hmm? Forever? One? Twice? Okay, so let's look at the implementation. The function just returns, uh, it yields 42. So there's yields just a single value. So this loop is going to run just once. Uh, so you're right. Uh, and um, if we, we can, of course, access the API more directly without using a range for loop. And then it will look something like we can, uh, gen is the generator that's created by the compiler from our function. And then we can call begin to get the iterator to the values. Remember, this is a lazy iterator. So it only, in this case, it will only hold, it will hold the value of the first 
object, and in our case, the last one as well. And then we can access it. Or we can act com combine all of them together into a single call, where we're calling begin and the access operator, and this will also print 42. Okay, so the question was whether we couldn't know that Coro is a coroutine by examining its return type. I think I mentioned it before. We're going to see an example of that in a minute. So you're right. If it has a return type of that's uh, uh, coroutine compatible or, co or coroutine-based return type, you can assume that maybe there is a coroutine underneath, but maybe it's a function that's returning the result of a coroutine, and the function itself is not a coroutine. So it's, it, it's like a one-way... Uh, the probability is non-zero, but it's, uh, it's not guaranteed. Right. So, well, we, we only saw printing out one element, and that's really, really boring. Um, but remember, coroutines and generators in general are very, are very lazy. They don't need to generate the whole sequence uh, beforehand, so... Since the user, uh, uh, the question we had here before, the, the user really decides when they want to stop, so there's nothing preventing us from making uh, coroutines that never terminate, because they run lazily. They only run once per call. So we can write this coroutine called Iota, which co -yields, uh, takes some kind of integer, an unsigned integer, and it just every time increments it by one. So the user... Uh, in this case, we can see the example, copy n, is just going to copy n values, in this case, nine values, from IOTA uh, to the output stream, and just a minute, and it's going to print the first nine values from 42 onwards. Right, so, and the nice thing is that the, sometimes writing infinitely running code, because it's lazy, is very, very easy to reason about, very easy to understand, and we leave the actual iteration out of the loop. Uh, so to speak. Yes, there was a question? Uh, yes. Uh, what will be the return type uh, uh, In this case, it's a generator. I'm going to talk about return types in just a second. Okay. So I actually lied to you. Everything I showed you is not, is not exactly uh, how it should be. Uh, I will say all of the code that I showed here compiles on certain versions of Microsoft Visual Studio. Um, the first thing that I lied about was that uh, you can't have auto return type uh, on a coroutine. You must specify the actual type. And certain versions of Microsoft Visual Studio uh, did the very, very uh, convenient conversion from when it's an auto, it generated something called uh, stood experimental generator of T which answers your question about the return type. It's a generator that's going to return values of type T until it's done, if it's ever done, okay? Um, the thing is, it's called uh, STD experimental generator, but in fact, there is no standard uh, generator. So it's experimental in the sense that Microsoft decided to call it that, uh, but there is no such, uh, such type in the standard library. And maybe some future auto will do that, but at the moment, C20 does not have a coroutine support library. So our options usually are to use, uh, to write our own, or to use some uh, uh, available coroutine support libraries, like uh, Louis Baker's CPP Coro library, which is wonderful. Uh, see, uh, Microsoft provides their own, and I think most of the compilers today provide their own. There is a proposal. Uh, P2168 R3 going through the uh, standardization process. And in fact, a coroutine support library is one of the highest priorities for the standardization, uh, for the standards committee for C23. So it's pretty much, uh, I think it's a very high probability we will have some coroutine support library types in the next version of C. Until then, uh, you should use the uh, libraries like CPP Coro. 
I will occasionally continue to use auto where the meaning is clear. Like until now, most of you didn't understand what I'm talking about. Um, right, so let's see some more examples. So, Yeah, the case for auto not deducing the right type is because there is no actual type in the library that the compiler can decide to give you. Although Microsoft Visual Studio used its own generator type, but again, that's not standard conforming, it's kind of an extension, because if auto, it's an extension. Right, so I once needed to process some uh, neighborhood of uh, an image around a pixel and find uh, the, ne the closest neighbor that made sense using uh, uh, some scanning. And my solution was to scan the image around the pixel in a growing spiral until bumping into the first neighbor. So you can look at the first, uh, uh, I created a, a spiral generator and it runs around the zero, zero, zero. And you can see that the, the code itself is image, doesn't depend on a particular image, it doesn't actually take an image. It only gives us some offset from the zero, zero or, or pixel, and it just yields the value of the current pixel of the spiral lazily. So, as you can see, just spirals to infinity, it never stops. It doesn't care what, uh, you, it doesn't need to know how big your images are, if they're eight by eight uh, icons, or if they're huge uh, terabyte uh, satellite images. They will all, the spiral itself just spirals continually from the beginning, around and round to infinity. Um, the nice thing is that I don't need, I don't, I'm not going to explain how the code works because that's not really part of the message I'm trying to say. What I do want to say is that if you want to figure out how the code works, all you need to do is examine that particular function. And if I spread the implementation for that, generator over a constructor and an increment operator and an access operator, uh, it will make our life uh, uh, trying to maintain this code much more difficult. So this is what I mean about reading and maintaining nice linear code. Uh, and the logic here is relatively simple, but again, it's not part of what I want to show. And when I, I wanted to make this pretty animation, uh, so I, I decided I need to uh, generate new colors for every pixel. And how am I going to do that? I wrote this, uh, another generator, another core routine. I called it the hue cycle gen generator. And it takes a step, and it's just going to iterate, uh, it's going to work in the color space called HSV, and the hue determines the color, all the rest of the channels are the same. And again, the actual details are not really important. Usually images work in RGB, so there's some versions from HSV to RGB, we can yield the converted RGB, but RGB is a one by one, a one pixel image, HSV is another one pixel image, we just, and we just increment uh, the values. And again, notice this is an infinitely running um, generator. So it just loops around the 255 values of the hue channel, always returning the next, uh, the next step, incrementing by step. So in that case, the step was one. In this example, the step was 10. So you can see that the colors are changing more, more frequently. And we have two generators. Now. And the question is, we sort of need to work on an image and we need to run them in parallel or in tandems, in lockstep, one by one, and increment both of them. And we do know that range four gives us a really nice interface for interacting with generators and iterators. So, but now because we have two, range four only works with a single iterator or single generator. It's going to be, we need going to have to break, maybe do we have to break it down and try to use begin and all of those? And actually the answer is no. There's a nice function called zip. You may know it from other uh, programming languages or functional programming. And again, it's a code. And it's a coroutine that's actually a template, which is nice. So we now know that uh, we said coroutines are functions and templates can be functions. So again, we take two generators, we take their begin, uh, the begins of both of them, and then we simply iterate until all of the, uh, bo both of them end and we return or we actually yield the pair of the results from both iterators. So in this case, 
we're going to get the position and the color one by one from our, our spiral. And how do we use it? Again, we're using the uh, range for loop. Now, we, we, we're zipping together the spiral and the hue cycle. We're using uh, structured binding uh, to, to give names to the elements of the pair. So we have pause. Pause would be a point, uh, a coordinate, x and y. We have color, which will be some kind of uh, OpenCV color type. And then all we're doing is uh, taking the point where we want to place our, our spiral, the, the, the start of the spiral. And if the point is inside the image, we set the color to it. So this is very simple. It's very uh, uh, succinct. Yes, question. I'm not entirely sure I understand the question. Okay, the question is whether I can use the value returned by a generator more than once, essentially. Without recomputing, well, that's exactly what we're doing here inside this loop. So once we have pause and color, they're bound to the values returned by the current iteration of both generators. And so in this case, we're using it once, but and pause is used there. But you could actually use it as many. It's just a local variable, so or it's it's actually a reference to the to the pair. So you can use it as many times as you want in your program. Because the external user decides when the next iteration is going to be, once you're bound, you have a named binding to the value, you, can treat, you should treat it like a regular variable. There is no distinction. And again, this all goes back to the um, important feature that coroutines are an implementation detail. So nobody said that uh, Spiral is actually implemented as a coroutine. I could have implemented it as a, some other iterator type. So you can call the you can create a new generator if you want to generate the same iteration again. Of course you can store your values and then reuse them if you want. Right. So um, I will say this is a very naive zip, zip function, just a minute. It uses just two values, and it's probably not as efficient, and there are a lot of edge cases. Uh, the ranges v3 library does have its own much more generic multi-generator supporting zip. Um, I know there's a zip uh, a proposal going through the standards, so hopefully by 20, uh, C++ 23 we might have uh, a standard conforming zip. Yes, another question? OK. Uh, yes? Uh, let's leave that to the end. Uh, the question was about the bi-directional iterator. Um, I'll show you something even cooler right now. Okay. So let's say we have a, a tree. And anyone who's taking a basic data structures course, you remember that we have many ways to traverse a tree. And uh, the three most common and popular ways are in order, pre-order, and post-order. And the differences really are, do we first give all of the, uh, uh, in order means give all the, the values from the left child, then, my, then the current node, and then all the values from the right child. And we usually write it using recursion. So in this case, I wrote a, an, uh, a little uh, example. We have a tree node. And again, it has three methods. One is called in order, one is called pre-order, and another one is called post-order. I didn't put the implementation here because it's very, very similar. Just switches the order. You can see that the difference is just the order. It's exactly, the, literally, the order of the calls. And in in order, 
we check if the left child of the tree is uh, non-empty, then we're looping, we're calling its own, we're recursively going into its own coroutine method and yielding that value. So if we saw a coroutine template in the previous slide, we can see that coroutines can also be methods and they can also be called recursively. So like I said, we shouldn't be surprised by this because they're just functions. Yes, question. Do you think that's exceedingly Hold that thought. Okay. Um, the question was whether it's memory inefficient. Hold that thought. Um, right. So actually the code is very readable, I think. It's very similar to some pseudocode you might read in a book. And how do we use this? Well, you can look at the... Uh, there's another function called... Um, very, it's called order, and you just tell it which uh, traversal order we want to choose, and it will return the correct method, or it will call the correct generator to perform that traversal order. I will say to the more advanced, uh, uh, keen-eyed um, people in the crowd that there is some type erasure going on here, because all of these are returning the same type. So there is some type erasure. I'm not going to go into that right now. And the way we use it is really as we would expect. There's a simple range for loop. We call the, the correct ordering function, and we just print out the values of the tree. So th there was a question here uh, uh, before about uh, bidirectional. In this case, it's not bidirectional, but it's actually re recursive. So we're traversing a full tree with recursion. And you know, if you try to think about how you write this as a, an iterator type, and the logic with multiple, we have uh, three co-yields inside our, our logic, and we have to keep a much more complex state. And the word state is, we're going to see it in a little bit. Um, but regarding your question, there's an even cooler implementation of this. And this, the libs, uh, lib coro from Lewis Baker has another type called recursive generator. And this one, to write each of these methods, with three lines of code, because when we are co-yielding the generator itself, it's going to perform that particular loop uh, until it's done and then go on to the next. So this is kind of like the uh, yield from in Python, if, if one's familiar, um, which is really cool, really. That's the, the, the simplest pseudocode that you read in a, a data structure tree algorithms would map directly to this code. Um, the proposal for uh, STD generator that's going through the, the standards right now is actually automatically recursive. So, and it doesn't pay, uh, you don't pay uh, a hard penalty on that. There's also work, again, this is very advanced topics, so I'm not gonna talk about it, but uh, coroutines are, w people are working on making them tail recursive. So a lot of these inefficiencies in the destructors are going to be taken care of. Uh, they're very, very interesting issues. Um, you can check out the Slack channel for coroutines. Uh, I'll mention this a little bit in the end. Right, so, yes. Yes, I understand. Okay, the question was, I'm going to rephrase, is whether we can uh, pass some information into the coroutine while it's running. Uh, I wasn't going to mention that. Um, Co-yield some variable is not a statement, it's an expression. So it can return a value. You can store that value inside your coroutine implementation and use that. So one of the ways, and this is going to answer your question as well, is... Uh, performing something that appears like uh, a random access iterator and allow you to pass data into and out of the iterator. This is a very, very advanced topic. 
there are some issues related to forward iterators and the types that are returned by, uh, but in general, yes, you can do that. Um, but again, now, there, there's a lot of room for innovation because I think there's some really cool stuff because the type of the expression doesn't even have to be the same type as whatever is co-yielded. So, um, Is not? Yeah, oh, yeah. The order fun the order method, the reason I showed it is that it's not a coroutine. This answers the question you had before about a function that returns a coroutine type, but isn't actually itself a coroutine. So you can't really know from the signature whether it or not it's a coroutine. Right. So when you squint hard enough, one of the conceptual models that I like to think about is that there is some kind of conceptual similarity between what the compiler does with lambdas and what it does with coroutines. So these are both kind of compiler magic code generation engines. So in lambdas, we, we write something that looks like a function, but in fact, the compiler generates an object which has a function call operator and certain rules. And it co copies the captures as members of this object, uh, this unnamed, unknown object type. Well, coroutines uh, do something similar. We have something that looks like a function body, but then the compiler really does code generation on steroids, and it generates something much, much more complex than what a lambda does, kind of a little bit beyond what we want to talk about here. But again, it generates something that, for example, for generator types, it will appear like, a fun, like an iterator. Um, the closures for the lambda become kind of, uh, members, essentially the state, the local variables that we have inside our function become members of this object which reside on, resides on the stack frame. And again, uh, although we don't know the type of a lambda, we do know the type returned by a coroutine generator. That's a type that's built especially to interact with this compiler magic. So I think if you're looking for a conceptual model of understanding how coroutines happen and how to break down the magic, a good model or a good starting point is to think about lambdas and uh, APIs. Now, yes. Okay, so the, the question was about the performance penalties. Um, it's not a yes or no question. Um, I will say, if you want to do an eager operation over an array, then you're probably, uh, a loop is one way to do it. Usually there are even better ways. You can use uh, intrinsics, you can use the GPU. So you don't necessarily get the best performance by writing regular non-coroutine. So, but if you do need the iterator abstraction, then coroutines are one of the fastest way to do it. Now, uh, you did, uh, it does mention that the stack frame, this object that the compiler generates for us, usually resides on the heap. That's where we store this object because it needs to be resumed later. So it can't, uh, in general, be on the same stack as the function that's calling it. However, and specifically, uh, particularly for synchronous generator type, coroutines, the compiler can optimize away this uh, function, this, sorry, this heap allocation and keep everything in the same stack as the original function. So very, uh, uh, most of the functions that you see here that I showed will actually be optimized away into, regular, uh, into the uh, regular stack of the function that's calling them. So you won't pay any extra penalty for that, but your code is still readable. So yes, there is, I guess, some kind of trade-off. But the, the expressiveness that's allowed by coroutines is often uh, more important than very particular optimizations, which you may have to do anyway in your code. So it's better to write something general and then optimize particular cases than commit to a really complex API that's hard to maintain. Um, C++20 gave us coroutines. 
they only gave us the basic machinery for uh, the compiler magic that generates the coroutine, uh, the coroutines. So um, it's not perfect yet. And there are several problems that I wanted to show you um, about that, that, that can happen in coroutine to the unsuspecting user. So one of uh, uh, the uh, a very, I guess, relatively well-known problem is dangling references. So we have this function which takes a, a, a string and it just it, uh, yields the characters one by one, right? Uh, we've all written functions like that, uh, but this particular one is a coroutine, and all we do, this is a complete program, all it does is uh, uses the for loop, creates the string hello world, and then uh, prints out the characters, and I guess the, the, the name of the function explode is a, a, a kind of a, a subtle hint that this is not actually going to work. And can you guess why? Hmm? Dangling references, very nice. <laughs> uh, so actually what happens is because when we have a ranged for loop, we have a lifetime extension of the object on the right of the colon. So that temporary object that's created by explode, which is the generator type, is going to be lifetime extended to the end of the loop. What does that mean? It means that the coroutine, remember the return value of the, if this was a regular function, it would return some kind of, of uh, character. But in this case, this is a coroutine and it's returning a generator type. However, that coroutine takes a, a standard string by reference. So that means that hello world creates a temporary standard string which gets passed by reference to our explode function. Our explode function takes that reference and returns an object and that object is going to be lifetime extended to the end of the loop, but the temporary string is long gone by the time we enter the loop. So th this is not really a problem that's uh, related directly to coroutines. This is C++ reference, um, and it, it tells you about temporary region expression, uh, that this can happen in, in a lot of code. However, because of the major feature of coroutines that we get this nice, serial, easy to reason about code, it kind of becomes a little bit more explicit what we're actually returning and understanding that when we're passing things by reference, we have to make sure that they will outlive the generator type. Okay, so in this case, one way to do it is to just either take the string by value, so it will be saved instead the, st the stuck frame, the copy of the string, or just create the string outside of the loop and then this will work, because it's only working on references. The question whether a string view would work here, yes, string view would work here. Although if you take the string view by reference, which you, which you should never do, um, it will have the same problem. If you use a const car pointer, probably it would work because there is no creation of a temporary. Yeah, some idea. It's like string view. Okay. Right. So, as I said, it's a new feature in C++. It has certain limitations. They're new. And they're not complete in many, many, many senses of the word. So we did see that coroutines can be templates, like regular functions. We saw that we can have, uh, they can be lambdas, um, and they can be methods, they can be recursive, and so on. So in many ways, they're like regular functions. However, we can't really use the auto-return type. Maybe that will be really, uh, uh, um, improved in the future. I don't know. And. Uh, there's a few, there are a few more, yet they can't be const exp expert functions. Again, 
I'm not sure this will not be uh, lifted, this uh, limitation. Remember, things like const expr and lambdas, lambdas we've had since C11, and from version to version, they become more and more powerful. Const expr, I think the first version was also C11 or 14. And again, they began very, very simple and very limited. And the more we go, the, the versions of C increase, the better support we're getting. So believe that coroutines are going to see the same kind of evolution. Um, they can't be constructors. Constructors can be coroutines. Destructors can be coroutines. I'm not even sure I know what that means, not to mention main. I don't know what a cor main coroutine can mean, but again, this is the one uh, it's explicitly stated. Um, I think the major, major limitation today is that the standard does not provide a coroutine type library inside as a part of the standard but again this is one of the highest priority points for the standards committee and hopefully by c23 we will see some implementation until then you're encouraged to go and use uh, open source libraries like picoro um, there is an issue of quality of, of implementation so some of these support libraries, because they're not standard, may not support exactly the same API. So standard generator for, from CPP libcoro does, uh, allows you to pass in references, while Microsoft's version doesn't. You need to pass a std reference of the object. So there are differences in the API, which is understandable, understandable because these are just open source libraries. Uh, and nobody, they don't have a specification to work against. Uh, a more, a deeper problem is that compiler implementations might be different in terms of performance, like was mentioned before. Some of them might elide the heap allocations in, in more situations than others. So again, you need to measure, you need to test if you're adopting this feature. Um, I'm very excited about this. I think that coroutines in many ways, they change the way you think about your code. They change the way you break it up in your head and the way you reason about it. So I really, really urge you to go and check that out. Remember, every co-yielding function is really a generator. So although the generator library doesn't, uh, isn't written using coroutines for different reasons, it does interact seamlessly with generators created with coroutines. So it's very easy to extend, very easy inter interact with, like we saw with the zip function. So I encourage you to go and learn more. As I said, this is an introductory talk. I wanted to show you the uh, relation between these patterns of iterations and subroutines and iterators and ranges and how all of this ecosystem of design patterns fits together because I think when we talk about patterns, it helps us reason about our problems and our algorithms in a higher level and also discuss it with our colleagues. Um, there are here uh, to various resources about coroutines, the C++ Slack channel. Uh, who, who here is on the C++ Slack? Okay, not enough of you. I really, really urge you to go and check it out. It's a global community of C++ developers. A lot of the standard committee members are there almost daily. A lot of the paper writers, there's, there is a special channel dedicated to coroutines, um, and it's a great place to, place to ask questions and learn more. Um, I do have a blog post with the, uh, a slightly extended version of this talk uh, on my blog, and um, I urge you to go out and learn about coroutines. So, thank you very much. <clears throat> Any more questions? Yes. Yes. The, the, the question was whether the generator destructor deallocates a stack frame, and the answer is yes. A, a lot of the underlying machinery takes care that everything is called in the correct order because um, the compiler is really generating a very large state machine for you from this code. Because, every, for example, every core yield or core weight is an, another different flow that can happen. So the compiler takes care to make sure all of this state machine gets. Uh, works seamlessly. Yes, all the seemingly local variables are actually members of the stack frame and they get destructed in the correct order as if they were the serial code that we... 
No, it's not fiber. I said, I said this at the beginning. C++ coroutines are purely uh, logical. They're not, they don't use any operating system support for fibers. Fibers are a facility provided by the operating system. Okay, we can argue about that, but these are not... Okay. Oh, sorry, I'll rephrase. Most modern operating systems provide fiber facilities, and most CPUs provide support for those facilities. You can write, you can... Okay, okay. Yes. Okay, the question was, uh, Boot uh, ASIO, the ACS library, uh, does have uh, a really, really cool C header library that gives you generator coroutine types. It doesn't depend on anything else in Boost. I used, uh, I used that once instead of the Boost coroutine to compile some algorithm to, with a script into JavaScript because it didn't depend on anything from the operating system. So, yes, it's a... They're not meant to be combined together because those are just macros with some really clever switch hack hacks. Uh, anyone here know was, knows what the Duff's device is? Okay, a few people. So it's the same kind of trickery. Yes, Roy. Yes. Is the generate object? Yes, Gener uh, uh, coroutines in general are move only. Because they keep an internal state. It's if you want a new one, you call the constructor again. Uh, I can take them. Maybe. Any more questions? Yes. The question was whether uh, we have measurements about how coroutines can improve performance for iterating? Yeah, for, uh, for uh, about uh, relative to, as I said, if you need performance tight data, then maybe sequential iteration is the right thing to do. Um, coroutines, they abstract iterators in the sense that they allow you to decide what you want to do at every iteration externally. My hunch is that as, we, as compiler technology improves, the difference is going to shrink until uh, for certain usage patterns, the, the compiler will generate the same code. But again, this is just my intuition. Um, in general, if you need highly optimized code, frequently you won't even use the regular for loop. Uh, as I said before, you might use I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think uh, you need to measure anyway. Okay. Okay, last question. <laughs> the question is whether STD function will uh, be able to wrap a coroutine. My guess is yes, because STD function just takes, it uses type erasure, so it doesn't care about uh, the actual implementation of the underlying callable type. So there's no reason to assume it won't. Because as I said, to the user, 
the user never knows if the underlying function is actually a, a coroutine or not. So if you pass it something that's callable, then it will use that. So maybe not a generator, it might be something more uh, on the, of co-awaitable stuff. That you, I didn't mention this so much here, but there are coroutines which are not typically used as, as, uh, uh, as generators, but yes, you could... They're to the user, they're regular callables. So you can probably pass them to std function and it won't care. Okay, I think we don't have much time for more. So thank you very much for coming. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>